Mr. Williams, just looking at figure four, um, why is the department forecast to spend more than its capital budget in seven of the next ten years? Uh, so this relates to um, the allocations that we've made out uh, to uh, constituent parts uh, uh, of the department uh, and looks across uh, both the EP uh, and our infrastructure plans and, uh, and so on. Uh, in, in terms of variations against the core spend, uh, I think these are uh, quite small. We judge them to be uh, manageable. Um, uh, and we have uh, you know, a range of approaches in place to, uh, to deal with those. But uh, let me look to Mr. Bate for uh, a bit more detail on the numbers. I think it's because over £4 billion pounds over that, that period of those years, so you, you've, you've got savings against those figures, have you? So, Mr. Wild, that uh, presumes that all the departmental contingency is spent. So it is at the very prudent level that we're saying uh, everything would be consumed, and that is um, over four billion equipment plan uh, contingency. But actually, to the chair's points right at the start of the session, there is over another four billion for the wider uh, departmental uh, spend beyond the equipment plan. So those figures, uh, the, the numbers in Figure Four, uh, as I say, presume that all of that is spent. They're, they're not insignificant uh, numbers, but but we really think, given the contingency position. We, we have taken a conscious decision at this stage in the plan not to uh, fully address that pressure. This is where we have to balance financial and capability risk. And, and given the stage of the plan, given the changes, really significant changes that we've had um, subsequent to the integrated review and the spending review, uh, some of the uncertainty that still remains in costings and the schedules, that we do think we should hold that position for a little longer. The alternative is to take action now, but we do believe that would be precipitous and premature. Um, and that actually we might end up taking uh, decisions on reducing capability that actually as those years come closer that we don't need to do. So this all comes down to us managing the balance between financial and capability mm -hmm. risk and uh, we spent a lot of time on this as we close the last um, uh, budgeting cycle. We're again looking at it this year and we'll continue to look as we go years forward. Okay, clearly one of the areas which makes this plan hold together is again we move to figure six which is looking at planned cost reductions. So here we've got £7 billion worth of planned cost reductions, of which there's no plan for £4 billion of that. That £4 billion represents roughly the capabilities that were removed during the integrated review. So, Mr Williams, why are you confident that the commands will be able to identify those measures at that level? So, again, really just building on Mr Paint's uh, previous remarks, it's about the balance of capability and risk over a 10-year uh, horizon. Um, if we assume no uh, new savings can be generated in the uh, later years of the plan, then we will constrain ourselves to a uh, smaller equipment program that less well meets our uh, capability uh, aspirations. Uh, and so it is a judgment between uh, what uh, can be delivered. Uh, we have uh, fewer uh, savings measures uh, in uh, our current plan of uh, sort of low confidence than in the previous plan. Uh, that is positive. Uh, but I think it is reasonable to set a challenge for uh, ourselves, for the department to uh, continue to generate uh, additional headroom for investment in the capabilities that we need uh, across that 10 year period. Thank you. Sorry, Mr. Wilk, just say a little bit more. That, that, um, so, as the Permanent Secretary said, this compares to 12.5 billion unresolved shortfall last year. Mm. So we have significantly uh, reduced that number. You are right, there aren't at this stage specific plans against about 3.8 billion uh, of, of those uh, cost reductions. But in the spending review, it was agreed that, uh, as I said earlier, there are about 400 projects in the equipment plan we look at about 80 um, of those which make up about 80% of the spend. This is an assumption around savings that the uh, top level budgets, Air Command, uh, Army Command, etc., will drive in those remaining 320, 340 projects that we can't possibly at the head office go into the detail. Mm. So we do think there is significant savings around the scope uh, and around the priority of, of those projects. So it is a challenge on the TLBs, but it reflects our requirement to set taut but realistic budgets in each year for the equipment plan. Sure, so you've talked about it's a 10-year plan, which it obviously is, but £2.6 billion worth of those savings 
of the, the unidentified savings have to be delivered in the first four years. With committed spend contracts, how realistic, again, is it that you're going to deliver those savings? Again, if I may, that, that number reflects that um, uh, some of what might be done here is reprioritising, reprioritising between years, so we prudently haven't assumed that that saving continues at that level uh, beyond the spending review period. It's something we'll come back to. We do think it's a realistic level that can be saved. And, and with all of these savings, I would say that in, in year, we're nearly at the end of the financial year, the first year of the, uh, this equipment plan, that we are within our budget as a department. So we have delivered these. And uh, Mr Williams, what, what targets have you given the TLBs as to when they need to come back to you and the Secretary of State with firm proposals to deliver against those savings? Uh, so, well, we refine our view uh, of progress against those savings through our uh, annual planning round. So the, uh, the follow-on planning round is just coming towards a conclusion. That will be uh, set out in the uh, equipment plan publication and accompanying uh, NEA report for, uh, I hope, autumn uh, of, uh, uh, of this year. So it's a, uh, a refinement rather than a, a, a single... Uh, milestone uh, ask. Uh, actually, given the step up in the, uh, in the capital budget, in particular uh, in the early years, reflecting our experience this year, uh, I think uh, more of our focus uh, next financial year uh, will be about ensuring that we can uh, deliver on the spend that we are assuming, uh, bringing uh, uh, opportunity spend forward where, where that makes sense, uh, rather than looking to uh, manage spend down to a budget. So we have a, uh, a bit of a run into the back end of the spending review period uh, before we need to be delivering uh, these uh, savings in full. Okay, so you think you'll get the efficiency savings, but the report also um, highlights the work done by the Cost Assurance Service, which found over £7 billion of costs that they thought would come forward, which aren't covered in the plan. So that, again, is a further pressure. So what's your comment on that 7.6 yeah. So firstly, um, uh, for a small amount of credit, uh, obviously that, that's an internal uh, risk assessment that we are uh, entirely uh, transparent about. Uh, about a third of that figure relates to uh, the uh, uh, Dreadnought programme uh, and will uh, be covered by separate contingency arrangements uh, with the uh, Treasury if that risk uh, materialises. What, uh, what proportion of the 7.6 billion is dreadnought? Uh, 2.6 billion. It's so about a third. Um, uh, the residual uh, uh, risk uh, balances well against the uh, contingency that we are holding uh, in the equipment plan. And when you look at the the like for like population. Uh, from last year to this year, uh, the level of risk that, that CAS has identified has gone down by about 300 million. Uh, so part of the reason is that in, in the other areas, we're looking at programmes that are still relatively early uh, in their lives. So on the one hand, that means that I think the scope for financial risk uh, is greater, but it also means that we have more uh, choice of <coughs> successive approvals points to... Uh, think about how we manage that financial risk against the, uh, the capability that we want. Okay, so Air Command has also warned that one of the, um, the impacts of this will be fewer uh, flying hours. What's that going to do to our capability? So that's um, around how they are managing uh, their in-year challenge, and they, um, like all the TLBs, take a view on the priorities. Actually, a lot of that reflects moving uh, to far more synthetic training, uh, and um, uh, how, how they balance that out. So uh, ultimately, the Chief of the Air Staff is responsible for prioritising within his budget that they have uh, each Chief agrees at the beginning of the year, uh, and that is where they think they will go. OK, if I could just come on to um, workforce <coughs> issues. So um, I remember the 2015 review where a, a wedge was put against workforce without necessarily a whole lot of um, work behind it from the Cabinet Office. And here you've, you've obviously got the reduction in the size of the Army to 72,000, um, further military workforce reductions of six, over 6,000, and a 10% further reduction in the cost of the civilian workforce. So you're in danger of repeating those top-down targets through this period? So I don't, uh, I don't think so. Um, uh, and uh, we, we touched on this in our hearing uh, last year. So the, the reductions in 
uh, armed forces and military manpower uh, are relatively mature. So uh, the army has set out uh, its plan to uh, restructure and get down to uh, 73,000. Uh, and the Royal Navy and the Air Force uh, essentially have uh, their plans pretty uh, mature uh, as well. Uh, the workforce, uh, civilian workforce reduction, a cost reduction uh, rather than headcount uh, of 10% um, is a, a more manageable number than I think the, the roughly 30% uh, uh, wedge from the uh, 2015 uh, spending review. And over a period of uh, the spending review period, you, you, that, that seems to me uh, I'll come back to the question of pay in a, in a second uh, to be deliverable. Uh, we are looking to approach it on a whole force basis. So uh, where uh, commands want to look at the balance between uh, uh, regular uh, uniform staff reservists, uh, contractors uh, and uh, civil servants, uh, they have that uh, flexibility. Uh, so we are, um, you know, we are we are making progress on that. It's been a particular focus of this year's uh, planning round, uh, and we are beginning to sort of review uh, how well commands uh, and other parts of the the MOD are, are doing in in that plan. Um, so in, in in broad terms, I, I mean, I think it's it's deliverable. Um, there are um, uh, some additional reform measures that are. Uh, cross-cutting that we are looking to take forward, including uh, our share of the uh, government reform focus on uh, corporate services uh, modernisation. So uh, looking at how we can streamline process, looking at how we can uh, automate, uh, which I think will help uh, uh, over the, the period of the spending review, commands deal with the targets uh, that they uh, have been uh, they have been set. Um, clearly, when we're thinking about the cost of our workforce, uh, we need to think about uh, pay. Mm. Uh, and uh, underlying inflation, uh, cost of living, and therefore likely pay inflation, uh, is uh, not uh, where it was when we settled our spending review uh, in 2020. Um, uh, we have had some uh, assistance from the Treasury in SR21, uh, to meet those costs and indeed the national insurance employer consequences of the health and social care uh, levy. Uh, but uh, managing uh, uh, that pay pressure is going to be uh, an additional uh, challenge for us, at least in the, uh, the near term. Before it, just Mr. Wilder, I just may come in on this because another thing you were doing was the, the commands were funding the extra income tax in Scotland. Is that still happening? Uh, I don't know, Chair. Mr. Pate. Yes, it is. Um, from memory, it's it's low million, single figure million. Yeah, but it does mean that we've so. got people in the armed forces paid slightly different amounts depending on which country. And, and certainly, the, the ministry is is compensating for that. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Well. So, when do we expect to see um, proposals for that ten percent reduction in the, the overall headcount cost? Do you have? Do you have that internally at the moment? Do you have a line of sight to deliver that? Or you said you think it's reasonable, but is there a bit more substance behind it? Uh, so we are collating and reviewing um, plans uh, that have been built bottom up from the frontline commands and the enabling organisations uh, in the department as part of this year's uh, planning round. Uh, and we will review that um, uh, over the course of the next, uh, next couple of months. Okay, um, it's one of the areas you'll be looking at the uh, level of spend on consultancy and temporary staff, which, according to our annual report, was £311 million pounds, um, in 2020-21. Yes. Do you have a target by which you're planning to do that? Uh, I don't. So it is part of our so overall... That, just to be clear, that was up from £40 million, up £40 million pounds on the figure for 1920. So our spend on consultancy and, importantly, on contingent labour and professional support services is part of those workforce cost envelopes. So we are uh, asking our top-level budgets to set out how their balance of workforce is, is best allocated within that budget envelope. Um, and it's important to recognise there are different things that we're, we're spending on there, particularly professional support services, uh, Sir Simon spends 
quite a large proportion of that in DNS for particular skills that we need that we can't get from Crown servants. Contingent labour, similarly, frankly, reflects the state of the, the labour market where we uh, are struggling to recruit in specific sectors, so we have to bring people in if we're not to uh, slow down delivery of, of the equipment plan and our other plans. Yeah, I was going to come to this asylum because um, you, you, your organisation spent £100 million pounds of that £311 million, again, up from £76 million pounds the year before. What, what lie behind that high increase? <coughs> well, um, in terms of the services that we procure, as Mr Pate uh, uh, has just outlined, so legal, uh, legal services is, is uh, one area that... Uh, uh, that uh, is prominent there. Uh, independent safety advisors, um, and in particular, some niche uh, engineering skills. When we're talking about things like, as we were earlier, typhoon radar, etc., there are certain skills that we uh, uh, we don't have uh, within the organisation. Um, and then c contingent labour. So uh, to uh, um, to move with the peaks and uh, troughs uh, of of the demand signal. Um, we do have uh, a number of people that we hire from, uh, from the private market, private sector market. Um, and we, whereas I want to reduce those, we, we don't want to zero them because uh, it is actually quite an efficient way mm. uh, of uh, tackling peaks in demand. So what would you expect the figure to be next year? Um, I haven't got a figure with me now. You... Lower than, I, lower than 199 in million? The, the area that, uh, you know, that, that is probably uh, the one that is going to bear the most fruit is in, in terms of um, reducing the amount of contingent labour uh, I, I have. Uh, but in, in, in order to do that, I need to be able to hire. Um, and if there's, there's sort of the highest risk for all of the uh, project delivery organisations uh, at the moment, and indeed industry, is people. So uh, it is a market for people. But yes, I, I will be looking to uh, uh, target a reduction in that area. That's good to hear. F final one probably from me, Chair. Um, as well as the reductions in the size of the Army, the further military workforce reductions, the 10% overall savings, there's a further target to deliver £2.5 billion of further workforce savings over the 10-year period to 2031. Have you got an idea how you're going to deliver that? Uh, so, look, I mean, we have uh, uh, some ideas. Um, uh, the and, and this will be sort of subject to uh, agreement uh, in uh, the next Spain review. Uh, generally speaking, it's a uh, continuation of uh, the way in which investment in technology allows you to uh, free up headcount, whether that's thinking about military capabilities or, as I was talking about, corporate services modernisation in the way we... Uh, uh, run the uh, run the department. Um, we had some um, uh, some proposals that we discussed uh, in the last uh, spending review, uh, but ministers have uh, not yet um, uh, opined on those uh, in uh, in detail, and we'll come back to that in the next spending review. Okay, so that's obviously a very large figure. It's almost equivalent to your annual spend on permanent staff. Mm -hmm. So in the, the clock. Clock's ticking over a uh, over a period, though. Mm. Over a ten-year period, two point five billion every year. You're spending two point eight billion on permanent civilian staff. So just to put it in context, it's a significant wedge on top of the already significant reductions that you haven't been able to give us a firm idea of how you're going to deliver those, other than potentially technology. Well, I don't think it will be uh, met uh, solely through um, uh, civilian uh, reductions, but. We need to look at the whole force um, spend, so uh, the proportion is lower. Nevertheless, it's something we will uh, need to uh, close on uh, at the next uh, uh, at the next spending review. Uh, I mean, though, if you ask me, I mean, you haven't, but if you ask me, what worries me most about the uh, the workforce? It is less about the cost, uh, but it is more about our ability to recruit and retain people with the uh, skills that we need. And obviously, there's a relationship between the two.